Hello, everybody. This is my sex bio here. We are today with Dr. Mitchell Tepper. He is a sexuality educator and coach, and he is dedicated to helping people with disabilities and health professionals grasp the full potential of sexual response and expression post injury or illness. We are here with him today to talk about Tantra, which is um, something that is core to his work and that he has been working with for a long, for a long time. <laughs> So um, thank you, Dr. Tepper, for being here. And um, well, I hope that um, this conversation gives us a lot of insights for maybe even starters, people who have never heard of Tantra or people that are looking to just um, actually start or are already starting into it. Thank you so much. How are you? Great. Thank you for having me. And I love, you know, my sex bio. Thank you. So we were thinking we were going to start by just, you know, asking you to define Tantra. Maybe if you could, if you were asked to define Tantra in a sentence or two, how would you define it? What would you say Tantra is? Usually start by saying what Tantra isn't. So Tantra isn't a religion, right? So you'll find people who say they are goddesses, right? And you talk, you, we talk about worship and sacred sex. So Something could be sacred, but it doesn't have to be a religion. So number one, it's it's not a religion. It's consistent with any religion you practice. It's it's not, there's no conflict between practicing Tantra and practicing a, any religion of your choice. So it's, it's not a religion. And what it also is, it's actually in its essence, it's not a sexual practice, right? So we think about Tantric sex. Tantra is... A way of life. It's a way of life that promotes a deep awareness, right? Deep mindfulness, being in the moment, and important to people with disabilities and Ill illness, but everybody in this society, it promotes deep acceptance of who you are as a person, right? You are natural, you are born. And, and we're natural and also sex is natural. You know, sex isn't a good thing or a bad thing, right? So a lot of people carry sexual shame or guilt or after a disability, they're attached to what sex meant for them or what it was like for them before. But with the tantric perspective, there's unattachment, there's acceptance. And as people with disabilities, as people with chronic conditions, as people who's gender expression may be different than the norm, whose orientation may be different. It fosters acceptance, deep acceptance of who we are. And through that, and through taking everything as natural, we can transform, basically grow into our best potential. And I think sometimes for many people, you know, and especially people struggling maybe with mental health issues, this part of saying, you know, like being in the moment, being present, accepting myself, these things sound difficult to do. So I don't know if like in, in your experience or, you know, like maybe from your own personal journey or from, from what you've learned, um, like how can people, you know, just approach this in a way that becomes a little bit more accessible if that sounds like a, you know, like a huge thing for somebody to do. Well, what I teach actually is accessible Tantra. <laughs> right? And this is accessible for everybody. So in the case, I'll start with a physical disability or, 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 or chronic physical condition before I go to a, a, a mental or psychological struggle. Um, to fight the fact, I was an able-bodied person 40 years ago. I was a, a lifeguard, a springboard diver. I did karate, right? And when I broke my neck, I lost the ability to do those things in the way I used to do them. It is pointless for me to dwell on the past and to dwell on what I used to be able to do. As long as I dwell on that and compare and feel sorry for myself because I can't, I can't move on. I can't grow as who I am, right? So now let's say I have depression, right? And so and we'll talk about clinical depression, not I'm just down, I'm just blue. I have clinical depression, right? If I beat myself up because I have depression, yeah. right, it's going to make me more depressed. 
if I could accept the fact that I have depression, if I accept the fact that it's a medical condition, if I accept the fact that I'm doing whatever I can to manage my depression, then, and, and I'm not afraid to share with my intimate partners that I have depression, right? And then life becomes easier. We are working from a place of where we are. That doesn't mean I wish I wasn't, I didn't have depression, right? So it, it, acceptance doesn't mean I wish things weren't different. It doesn't mean I wish I could walk. It doesn't mean I wish I didn't have to deal with this. I wish I didn't have to take medication. It doesn't mean any of those things, right? It means I'm not going to feel ashamed because of my mental illness or my depression or my you know, anxiety disorder. I'm not going to feel guilty about it. I'm going to accept it when I accept it. If I want to feel better, if there are things I can do, if I want to take medication, I will. If I don't like the effect of the medication on my creativity or whatever, or on my weight, then I won't. But to accept yourself as you are, because we can't change that in the moment, right? We could grow from where we are, but only through acceptance, not through fighting, not through guilt, not through shame. That's true. I don't know if you have any any thoughts on like, what are like the main or the core ideas that society use, like usually teaches us that we kind of need to let go of before, you know, we try Tantra, for example, or while we do it. What I say is that we all learn, at least in the West, uh, you know, a Western model, a medical model of sex or a friction model of sex, right? And it friction a model or medical model of sex says it's performance-based and mechanistic, which means if you put the appropriate stimulation right? And the right amount of friction at the right speed, right? To your clitoris or to your penis, that will take you on, you know, an increase in your heart rate and your respiration and magically to orgasm, right? And in the medical model, when I research orgasm, because I was an orgasm researcher, uh, you know, scientists who like to measure things in the lab, measure orgasm and define it as Uh, really just a general reflex, right? When in fact, deep orgasm research that looks actually at the mind shows you that the mind, orgasm is a mind, a brain mediated event, right? Yes, most of us know or come to orgasm through general stimulation, right? But when we understand orgasm as a brain mediated event and where the position of our mind is going to determine more about a good sexual experience than the position of our bodies. And I often say that feeling in our heart is more important than the feeling in our genitals, right? And the quality of connection. So the, the medical model is friction-based, performance-based, mechanistic. And when there's a problem, we're treating it with medicine, right? To, to try to you know, counteract problems with desire or problems with sexual performance or response, right? So Tantra or an Eastern model of, of, of sex comes at things from a very different perspective, right? So a Tantra, orgasm and Tantra is the result of three elements, uh, We talked about unattachment, right? Uh, but there's letting go and there's, you know, being in the moment and the, the three elements, timeliness, egolessness, and being natural. Th those are the three elements. And those three elements is what gives you the ecstasy, the bliss. And in modern psychology, right, we talk about flow states, right, Where, or being in the zone, right? So if you're yeah. exercising, 
you're doing something strenuous, you're mountain climbing, you're doing something that, you know, I know like I hand cycle and when I'm going up the hill, I am focused on going up the hill because if I don't go up the hill, I'm going down the hill backwards and I'm going to die, <laughs> you know? And the same thing if you're rock climbing, right? Or skiing down a very, you know, treacherous, you know, yeah. black slope, right? If you're not focused, if you're not in, in the moment, you're going to get seriously hurt. But in those, in those moments, in those flow states, when you're in the zone, right? People are feeling immensely energized, right? They're feeling totally involved. There's great joy in being in a flow state or being in the moment, right? And so basically using a tantric perspective, when we engage in sexual activity, we lose track of time. We lose track of ourselves, egolessness, as in we're not worried about, do I have a quad belly? You know, uh, am I going to fart? You know, uh, <laughs> yeah. am I making too much noise? Right. And so these, these things, because uh, we have no ego, these are, these things are natural. And if we're natural, egolessness, and timelessness, then, and we could be in the moment and really enjoy the sensations and the pleasures of sex. So that's, that's where this, you know, mantra or energetic uh, model comes from. So we, we talk about Tantra being a way of life and acceptance, unattachment and letting go. And, you know, I said, it's not a religion, but there is a spiritual aspect very strong spiritual aspect. Yeah, thank you. So the spiritual aspect, right? If we believe that we are part of creation, right? And we are all connected, right? And we as humans are born from sexual energy, right? We're born through sex. And we are sexual people from birth. And if we look at that as like life force energy, and that energy, you know, is if we use it properly, connects us with other people and the universe, right? So spiritually, like in a Judeo-Christic perspective, right, for people with disabilities, if you believe that we're all made in the image of God, right? If you believe that we all have values as human beings you know, totally not connected to what we could produce in society, totally disconnected from economic value. We have value simply because we were born into this world as humans and every human is, is born. If we believe everyone is equal, everyone is born in the image of God, then those beliefs lead us to a very spiritual aspect I think I like that because it takes me to kind of a little bit of what I was um, talking about earlier about, you know, these va values that we have in probably our mainstream culture or societies usually in general, because it becomes even, if you think about it, a little bit of a political type of thing, like almost a political sense of like, because if you, if you start to believe that you're part of this whole creation, then you somehow become a little bit more humble. And then that can lead to, you know, a different way to maybe having relationships with other people and seeing the world, you know, even in political probably aspects in a different way, I would say. Absolutely. Because you could only be humble. If I'm the same as you, if we both came from the same source and if we're connected, then how could I be superior to you? On the flip side, how could I be inferior to you? Right. And so we're going to think about things in, in a totally different way. So like oppression and shame start to go away because they, they have no no space because they just don't make sense. Don't make sense there. Right. There's no space for them. That right. is beautiful. I would like to know a little bit about, you know, like the history of Tantra and how because it's also and maybe let me give you a little bit of context of why I ask this is because like, you know, our history is full of a lot of moments where, you know, the people who are in power 
took some beliefs, changed them, completely erased them. So I think it's important to take a moment to talk about that. And then like, I'd like to know, um, maybe why can you tell us a little bit about the history of Tantra and then maybe how, um, how that changed when it was brought to the West and, and maybe where things were lost in the middle of that? Well, things are actually lost in the East too. So <laughs> if, yeah. If, so the history, so Tantra, let's say it's between 3,000 and 5,000 years old, right? And, you know, whether you look at it in be, being in India or Nepal or in, you know, maybe in, in China, right? Or maybe all of the above, it's, a, it's an Eastern philosophy. If you go to India now today, and I haven't been there since 2006, but I understand from other people in India doing sexuality education, sexuality education is almost non-existent and sexuality is not embraced as something positive or natural. And that is a result of really Christian values being imposed on a country, yeah. right? And so even in India today, from what I hear from my friends who live in India, there is not a tantric perspective when it comes to sex, right? Because of all the negativity and shame. So we have an old philosophy, right? We also have the same kind of Tibetan roots uh, are, are for mindfulness, right? So we accept mindfulness this day as a, as, a, as a widely accepted psychological practice, right? Every article is about mindfulness. We use it. Uh, you know, I used to work, you know, within the Veterans Administration system and, and mindfulness was accepted as, a, as, a, as, a, as an evidence-based practice. You know, so things have to go through a high bar of evidence-based in order to be used at the VA. So mindfulness is used there. And then you can find all kinds of mindfulness acts. And yoga, although if we look at the, the history of yoga and Tantra from a philosophical perspective, they're somewhat opposite. Because in Tantra, you're accepting, and especially around sexuality, and in yoga, you're, you're trying to change, you're fighting nature, as I understand the, the philosophy of yoga. Now, yoga in the way it's practiced today, at least where I practice, I, they, the teacher preaches that yoga is a breath practice. So, so, you know, I focus on, you know, mindfulness and in yoga as a breath practice when we get into skills for Tantra, but getting to the history of, of Tantra, when it was brought to the West, and that's not just the United States, but also, you know, Europe, right? Tantra, a lot of it was about sexual gymnastics and more about the physical and getting into different positions, right? And different esoteric ceremonies. Mm -hmm. Not that there weren't ceremonies three or 5,000 years ago, but you didn't have to tie yourself up in a pretzel. You didn't have to get into esoteric positions, you know? And so when I look at Tantra, I look at the essence of Tantra. And so this, you know, Westernized Tantra has been sexualized. And that's why the Westerner thinks Tantra is sex. Tantric sex. Tantric sex is sex approached with a Tantra mindset. You don't need to have any physicality at all. You don't need a partner through meditation and mindfulness and breathing, sound, moving vibrations. You could experience great pleasure, transformation, ecstasy, bliss without a partner. So, you know, sex in Tantra is a vehicle for transformation. It is not Tantra, Western images uh, of Tantra are a sexual practice. And with that sexual practice, there's all kinds of things. And, and all of that may be fun, right? Or interesting, yeah. or you might be curious, 
but I teach accessible Tantra. I teach just the, the mindset because once again, pleasure and orgasm is a brain mediated event. Having a negative mindset, being filled with shame and guilt, thinking, you know, negative things about sex can affect your sexual response, your pleasure and your orgasmic response. So, you know, I don't believe that when a couple gets together, so we talk about couple sex, right? That there needs to be a lot of physicality that you're thinking about, right? So there's nice positions you could get in. So you could go face to face or eye gaze, or, you know, you could, you know, um, embrace your partner in certain ways. So there, there are some lovely positions for connection during that. But what's important is, you know, the essence. And when, when I'm teaching folks, I, I talk about these three things, stop, focus, and connect. So in That's stopping, beautiful. we have to slow everything down, right? People want to quick, quick, yep. get in, get out, get off, right? So we want to slow things down. We want to slow things down physical, but we want to slow things down in our brain. If we're thinking, oh, do I smell? You know, how do I look to my partner? Am I going to be able to last long enough? Uh, am I going to be wet enough? You know, um, whatever. We have to slow all that thing down and that we could use our breath to come into the moment and then to, you know, focus, right? So one thing we haven't word, two, two words, I don't think I, I used yet. So when we talk about focus, we're talking about setting an intention, right? So set an intention for pleasure or whatever the intention is, but set, you know, a positive intention for that engagement. You may want to verbalize that. You may want to communicate that to each other. You know, I'm looking forward to a real fun time with you. I'm really looking forward to having some hot sex with you. <laughs> Set an intention and then pay attention. Pay attention to what's going on in your own body for your own pleasure and physio physiologically. So many men, you know, in this culture, they're paying attention to their partner thinking that they have to perform and get their partner off. And That's you come, true. Right. So when you're doing all of that, you're not focusing on your own pleasure. Right. It sounds counterintuitive, but the partner knows you're putting on a performance for them. Yeah. And, you know, it works when both people's sexual response is strong and good. You know, so there's strong desire and you hook up with somebody. It, it could work. You know, that's that's not like just going at it. It's like doesn't work for people. Right. We're talking about quality sex over a long term, long, long, yeah. long term, or, uh, or, or a hookup that's, that's, you know, longer and richer than a wham, bam, thank you, man. <laughs> so, yep. so we have to, you know, set a positive intention. We have to pay attention to what's going on in our own bodies, right? And in what's going on with your partner. So you want to be there for your partner, you want to tune into what's going on for yourself. So if you're uncomfortable, you don't just lie there and bear it in pain. You know, while your partner's doing something you don't like, it's a, excuse me, you know, I'm feeling a little pain. Let's change position. Let's do it slower. Let's do it differently. Right. So, and then to connect, right. We use our eyes. If we can see to connect, we use our breath to connect. We use touch to connect. Right. So stop, slow things down, focus, have a positive intention, pay attention to what's going on. And that's where, you know, breathing and yoga helps the practice of that and connect in any way you want. It could be connecting over, you know, writing erotica to each other, sexting, you know, could be online. It doesn't have to be in person. So that's that's what I think, you know, the skill-based uh, component, uh, those are those are the skills. And, and I say that people should just get a mindfulness app because there's not, like I said in the beginning, there are people who say, I'm, I'm a, I don't see many tantra gods there but there are male men there are plenty of men tantra teachers but there's this whole culture of of goddesses and 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 a lot of stuff usually they're very expensive the time they charge so we we we, we don't have to go there we could just you know stay with these you know stop focus and connect and and um you know i think this will improve a lot of people's sexual experiences 
not just people with disabilities or chronic conditions or, or mental health issues. Yeah, that's true. Because I think, and then maybe some of this could sound like it's just maybe um, some sort of groundbreaking stuff, but it isn't really because like, I think everybody, and if you go online, you see it, you know, all these type of jokes of how women are always making the list of the to-do list in their minds while they're <laughs> at it with their partners and things like that. And I think um, to that point, it's also important to just like normalize talking about sex in general. And I think it's a good moment to just, you know, underline that because you just said it, right? Like you're not going to stay there and stand something you're not enjoying, right? So I think our culture in general needs to be more open to, you know, like just having this, this bits of words when you say, hey, let's change. I'm not feeling well and this type of thing. Um, I also like what you said about about this performance and how you said you know when your partner is putting the performance up and I think it's it's very interesting because it also like yeah it, it just um it's a little bit contradictory even because you would think that if you're focusing on getting your partner there that's just you know that's going to help you get them there but then as they know that you are putting up that performance you might even also because you're not focusing in the moment You are, you're missing the, the, the cues that they might give you with your body, with their body saying what they actually need instead of just like, you know, like I'm not, and, and, and usually, and this is another thing, I think that also tantric sex can, is, you know, bringing up as opposed to just like quote unquote regular sex is the focus of regular sex usually, you know, in the media everywhere where we learn it, it's just getting there, right? Just And then Tantra is telling us differently, like, okay, we can, you know, focus on maybe connecting and pausing. And I think that is all very valuable, as you said, for, for everybody. But I just, it just made me think how actually, how evident it is that, and how contradictory it is that when you're trying to focus on, on, on that, because you're so, um, you're focusing on the, on the, on the product, but not on the, on the result, on the end product and not on the process. Right. And I think that, you know, that relates to life in general. Like it's not even about sex. I think we tend right. to go about it in life. So if you are, uh, if you practice Tantra as a way of life, then you will approach your work that way. Right. And you will approach, you know, Other, other aspects of life that way. So it, it's really a, like I said, it's a philosophy, it's an orientation as far as a way of life. And then you take it and you apply it to a sexual relationship or sexual activity. We call it a sexual relationship, whether it's with yourself or someone else. When I was watching this other video that you mentioned, so I, there, are, there are two things I'm curious about. You mentioned chakras in that video and you also mentioned um or well you just you have been talking about it like sexual energy in general so i think that's um it's interesting when you talk about like solo practices how just you know like to learn to just probably listen spot that sexual energy within yourself move it around all that and then also how chakras do they play what is their role in here like are they part of tantra or are they not um so Getting into, you know, a, a Tantra as an energy practice, right? And I was saying that we all have an energy body. As I said, we are, sexual energy is the life force, right? Yep. We're born through sex and you know, this is, this is part of who we are. And then we also have an energy body or race stubs called the light body, right? And it, it exists even when we lose our limbs, Right. So, and I, you know, give an example of shaking the hands, shaking the hands and stop. And you could feel the vibrations and you could feel beyond your body. And when you put your hands together, you could feel the warmth. What is that? What is warmth, but energy fire, right? And once you learn to identify your own energy and feel it, sometimes you got to get real close without touching. But once you got it, then you could learn to play with it, stretch it, move it, you know, and, and, and so sex becomes 
movement of energy and breath moves energy, sound moves energy, vibration moves energy. Right? And then it becomes moving energy and exchanging energy with, with a partner. And that's where distance isn't an issue when we're like this, you know, right? We could exchange energy without even being in the, in the same room. So that's where I call this like a more energetic model versus a friction model. There is no physicality uh, we, required for energetic sex. And then on that note, um, I don't know if there is anything like specific to sexual energy in itself that people could do probably as a part of like tantric sex, but like as a solo type of practice. So the, yes, well, I use, and I'm not really good at remembering the names of all the chakras <laughs> after all these years, <laughs> you know, I know where they are and I do breathing exercises, which touches on them. And, um, but to remember the names and the colors. So like, I have a beautiful uh, chakra meditation Mm -hmm. uh, done by a, a colleague of mine, Sally Valentine. So when I do a workshop, I play her meditation. And so if you can get a good listen to somebody walking you through a chakra meditation, right? And you learn to, you know, focus. Once again, you focus your attention on each chakra as you're listening to the color and the qualities of that chakra. This, when I listen to this, meditation so i just close my eyes and listen it's like she's a hypnotist you know it's like <laughs> she says the energy is swirling up my spine and my body is just like mm -hmm. you know i could feel myself undulating from my from my you know base of my spine up you know so i think that you know for me you know listening to a meditation that takes me through the chakras is a good way by myself to get in touch with the qualities and the components at night when I go to sleep, you know, I breathe through my chakras every, every night, you know, uh, you know, I do a, like a yoga nidra. I just do this like little, little meditation. Uh, and as I do it and I focus on my breath then I get into my breath, then I do a, a breathing exercise that takes me through my chakras and, I'm usually asleep by the time I sleep. <laughs> uh, thank goodness. But um, so people can learn to cultivate their energy. They could learn about. So, you know, reading about Tantra, you know, and reading books and practicing along with, with some of the guides, you know. And so there, there's like one of the books I have here. I don't know if you can see Don Lower on my bookshelf is Urban Tantra, right? So that's a more, you know, Western focus, obviously with the name urban, urban Tantra, but there's a lot of great breathing exercises and a, a lot of great other, you know, getting into darker type of Tantra and some of the more esoteric things with Western Tantra. But, you know, that's a, a wonderful book. I've got the Idiot's Guide to Tantra, Tantric Sex. I have a little blurb in there about Tantric Sex and Disability, but that's another basic book. And each one of these things will take you through, you know, your, your chakras. I've got more esoteric works. I and mean, this was one of the first ones that I read that got me hooked. Totally, you know, many, many years ago. <laughs> yes. this, this, is how it, this is how it started. And in it, so if I read this nearly 40 years ago, right? And in it, it says, you know, the time is coming where the world is going to accept Tantra. I think it's here. You know, if you look at all the different articles out there and all the focus right in this moment, and then there's like real esoteric stuff like ecstasy through Tantra. So these books get into, like I said, more, more esoteric aspects. And on the bottom of the pile, I can't pick it up, it's called The Essential Tantra, which is by Kenneth Ray Stubbs, who I credit for being one of my biggest Tantra teachers. And, and now, like I said, he's focusing more on energy and, and the body light, you know. Um, but The Essential Tantra is a great picture drawings and has different tantric ceremonies, bathing ceremonies, you know, so one wonderful things that you can do ceremonies, tantric ceremonies, uh, using using a tantra kind of philosophy and a tantric approach to sex. That sounds great. That's so cool. 
if you have like some specific very simple probably practices for like um couples that are actually trying to start this journey of tantric sex well it's um setting the intention and using using breath you know so they might want to get a couple of the like yoga pillows where they could sit on the on the ground you know not not in bed right and face each other and you know using using their breath one one exercise is really really powerful after doing maybe some eye gazing right is mirroring right so in workshops i have people touch you know sit face to face and put their hands and one leads and one follows right so it's it's like a dance right and so it's it's a marrow a marrow marrow marrowing marrow <laughs> am i o r i n g marrowing <laughs> exercise right so so that that's a wonderful exercise marrow marrow marrowing breath you know as in following your partner's breath or or even if you want to get more fancy they breathe out you breathe in right there's all different types of breath practices you have to learn them right? you can't just listen yeah. to me go get a book and say this is some basic mirroring breath so but by doing these practices you really learn to pay attention to follow to receive to give right cuz so many people it's unbelievable that actually everyone wants to give everyone wants to please their partner right so or yeah. get their partner off right yeah. people are not very good at receiving right totally so true. there's they they're like someone's pleasing you and you feel like oh you have to please them back so in tantra you could take turns you can practice receiving and you can practice giving orgasms don't have to be mutual simultaneous you know they don't have to be at all so so those you know i would say very simple practices would be oh, sitting yeah. on the ground you know eye gazing breathing mirror mirror around and coordinating, <laughs> coordinating your breath all right that all those are great get in the moment yeah i was imagining how this mirroring exercise could be and i think that because probably that also starts to lead you into feeling that energy but not only feeling it also sharing it so like you feel the energy of the other person and you kind of start feeling yours and how they respond how how it responds to your partner's energy and and and, and then then sex literally becomes a dance between two people which it is beautiful <laughs> yeah like how can i don't know if you have any thoughts on how to bring up this conversation how to start the I, conversation going i always tell people use me as an excuse <laughs> you know so whoever's or use you as an excuse i was yeah. watching you know i was participating in this thing at my sex bio and i saw dr tepper talk about this and and i really you know that that touched me it felt like this is something i i need and this is what i learned you know are you open to maybe exploring this with me or i read an article in you know x magazine and you know it really spoke to me and i'd like to you know share it with you what do you think oh you know that's a bunch of you know the partner might say you know it's, yeah. it's a bunch of who knows but you you say well you think so but wait what if i told you it's going to make your sex life better what if i told you it's going to make our sex life better what if i tell you you're going to make your your pleasure and your orgasm last longer is it still you know a bunch of you know mm-hmm. whatever whatever negative word they want to use to discount <laughs> it yeah so you know so i always say you know cuz i'm always either teaching or or writing is is say you know i was reading this i was watching that i learned about this it it you know it touched me or you know it spoke to me you know i'd like to share it with you so you're not telling your partner well sex is really getting boring you know sex isn't really doing it for me anymore those are not good ways to enter into the conversation wanna, yeah right you want to say oh i was reading i was watching i learned it spoke to me you know i'd like to share it with you you know what do you think you know you could open a whole conversation about sex whether it's good or not you know or how it can be improved even if it's not through a tantric perspective. Yeah. I think I agree and and I love what you said and I think also 
what I like about this is that, and it's also something I think it's important to underline is that we need to stop thinking of sex as something that we pretty much know, just, just know how to do, you know? And then like, we don't even need to talk about it and we, we just do it because we know how to do it. And especially when you're in a long-term relationship, I think it should be seen as this, you know, little thing that you, you create both of you and that, that is, that is your, is your creation is your movie is your, you know, whatever you want to call it. And then you get to direct it. But, but if you don't even, you know, talk about it, then it's just going to go a lot of different ways. <laughs> Lenore Chiefler, she's a, you know, great, you know, feminist educators, researcher, she has a book called sex is not a natural act. Right. So we think sex is a natural act. I'm saying sex is a natural act. Yoga, you know, I mean, Tantra looks at sex as natural, but, but her, 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 her thesis is sex is not a natural act. And why is it not a natural act? Because we don't learn about sex in a positive way. We don't learn about sex, you know, in a, in a, in a comprehensive way. We learn about sex primarily through the media, you know, through, you know, misinformation and through, you know, culture of shame. And, and, and when it comes down to, you know, sex before marriage, sex outside of marriage, sex with somebody other, sex with yourself, sex with somebody other than your opposite sex, right? So we are just grow up learning about sex from all of these external sources, right? All the different forms uh, that are giving us negative messages. So how could we be natural? Of course, sex is natural at birth. So <laughs> if we were born on an island, totally separate from any kind of out external stuff, I think we would discover, you know, ourselves sexually, and we would discover partners sexually. So, mm -hmm. but, but it can't be, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to accept it as a natural act when, you know, no one teaches us that everyone teaches us that it's something we have to be or buy something in order to be attractive and to perform, you know, adequately. Well, I understand you've done research on spinal cord injuries and orgasm. So like, could you tell us more about that? Like, what did you set out to do? What did you find out? Okay. Um, wow. Well, we, we haven't even gone there yet. Usually I do, I, I use my explanation or my, my discussion and my research and how to, how I got to the, the, you know, orgasm as a brain mediated event. So I started doing research in a laboratory with Dr. Beverly Whipple, who's known as the G-Spot lady or the G-Spot doctor. She wrote the book, the G-Spot. She did the, the research along with, you know, her professor at the time, Dr. Barry Komisarek. So the, the two of them have a orgasm lab at Rutgers University. So they were doing a study of women with spinal cord injury. So everyone said, oh, there's no information on women. Of course there is. The best, best sex information on spinal cord injury is on women. It's not disseminated well enough. And I've been writing and speaking about it for 30 years, but it's, it, it's out there. So through the study of women with complete spinal cord injuries, right? Looking at them, we had them stimulate themselves, you know, in complete meaning they had no feeling or sensation below their level of injuries, right? But we had them stimulate uh, their, their cervix. You know, we, we created a, a device, we won't get into the particulars, that had a pressure sensitivity. So the women can feel it, but it was connected to a computer. There were two PhD nurses in the room, Beverly Whipple and and Eleanor Richards, so they, they were in the room. Barry and I were out monitoring a computer, and so they say we'd say more pressure or less pressure. So there's a pressure transducer to, to, to give stimulation of the cervix because we were measuring different nerve innovations to the genitals. And then the anterior wall of the vagina, which is like the inside, which is the area of the quote unquote G spot, right? Or, or the or the you know female prostate. So it's, it's, it's kind of along the urethra. Uh, and so we were looking at stimulation of the, the, in, you know, the, the, the G spot, let's just call it the G spot, the, the vaginal wall, and then a, a area of their choice above the level of injury where they had feeling and sensation. And we were measuring heart rate, respiration, 
pain, because we're looking at the effect of sexual pl pleasure on pain attenuation. So, uh, you know, there's a difference between, you know, anesthetic, like an anesthesia, which blocks pain and pleasure and, and like a pain blocker. So sexual arousal acts as a pain blocker, but not a pleasure blocker, right? So we were looking at three nerve fibers, you know, looking at pinprick. So that's like the pinprick pressure. And we use different scientific tools. And um, so we looked at pinprick pressure and also temperature. So tolerance to hotter and hotter temperatures, hotter, you know, tolerance or, you know, pinprick feeling dull, you know, more and more until they could feel the pain and, and, and the, and the, the squeezing. So there's three different there's more, but let's just say there's three different nerve fibers for, for sensitivity in, in your skin. So we were looking at the effect of sexual stimulus on, on pain, also on spasticity and on pleasure, right? And what we found in the lab, we had able-bodied controls, but women who had no feeling and no sensation, no movement below their level of injury. So like most of them, and we were certain level, they were, they still had feeling in their, in their breasts. So these were women of a, an injury below what we call T6. So, um, so we had those women and three out of 15 women with spinal cord injury were, were, abil were able to experience orgasm in the laboratory. Science would tell you that that was not possible. That orgasm is not possible with a complete disconnection of the spine because it cut, connect, cuts the connection between the genital and the brain. And so therefore it's impossible. John Money came to this conclusion, a great sex researcher, just the wrong conclusion, right? So what we did is we verified in the lab using markers of orgasm, right? So that heart rate, respiration, pupil dilation, and also an analog scale where people said, I'm feeling, you know, eight out of 10, nine out of 10, 10 out of 10. So we had, uh, you know, a subjective measure of yes. pleasure, of excitement, along with physiological markers of orgasm. And so we demonstrated that women, even with complete injuries, can have an orgasm, both through genital stimulation, which doesn't make sense, and through stimulation of an area above their level of injury, right? This is the same laboratory with, Dr. with Gina Ogden, with Dr. Beverly Whipple, who did research on women who could have orgasm through fantasy alone without touching themselves, right? So now we, we show that women could have orgasms with complete injuries. We did identify a nerve pathway called the vagus nerve. It's a, look, I think the 11th or 12th cranial nerve that serves your face, serves your heart, lungs. The medical literature didn't have it going down to the genitals. So, you know, through the sham studies in rats, it's very difficult to explain in a short moment. Um, they proved that the vagus nerve innovates the genitals and has responsibility for pain attenuation, for reducing pain, right? And so my research, my own research, I was just part of that team, followed up with both men and women with spinal cord injuries, complete and incomplete, both those who reported orgasms and those who didn't. My question was, why? Why did these three women or five women, whatever, to experience orgasm. I think it was three out of 15. And why did the other ones not, right? And so through qualitative research and quantitative research, I came up to describe a, what we call a process of, of sexual self-discovery. And the follow-up studies from the team of Beverly Whipple and Barry Komisarek were MIR, M MRI studies of the brain, looking at women having orgasm why they were in an MRI. And that's where we get to these, you know, images of what's happening in the brain and show, you know, that this is a brain mediated response. So I, I use all this science so looking at women with complete to say, we can measure this, right? It's yeah. only a matter of time before we can measure the energy. Right now, the only marker of energy we could see is difference in heat in your brain right? Magnetic resonance, it's, it's in EEGs. They're all looking at changes in, in heat. Mm -hmm. It goes from orange to red to bright yellow when it's really hot. 
if you look at an EEG of a of a brain during orgasm. So so the my my research I use that when I'm trying to teach people who have lost sensation to say the position of your mind is more important than the position of your body. The feelings in your heart are more important than the feelings in your genitals. The quality of the connection is more important than any type of erection, clitoral, penis, whatever. That's what it, and that takes me to a tantric perspective where it's no longer tied to the physical we have to stop. We have to focus. We have to have an intention. We have to have attention, right? We have to connect, right? All that to learn to experience pleasure and orgasm again. And one of the things in my qualitative research, I asked everybody, you know, tell me about a peak sexual experience. And then they said, I needed to be with someone I trusted. So in the context of trust, which led to a feeling of safety, not necessarily physical safety, emotional space safety, led to a sense of connectedness, which led to pleasure and orgasm. Trust and safety are very important for really you know, profound sexual experiences because in the context of trust and safety, we can let ourselves be vulnerable, right? If we don't trust, if we don't feel safe, we still leave our guard up, right? So with trust and with safety, with that context, and sometimes that comes in a long-term relationship. It doesn't happen yeah. right away, but it didn't have to be. It could have been somebody in rehab with a, a like injury and they trusted them and they felt safe because they didn't have to explain everything about their injury. Uh, you know, I might have a bowel accident. I might this. I don't really feel that. They felt safe and comfortable with somebody else with a disability, with a like disability. And that led to, by surprise, an orgasm, which they weren't expecting. So context matters, trust, safety, and connectedness have the ability to transcend. This is where transcendence comes in any physical loss. We give you the ability to have pleasure and orgasm. And I use both because orgasm isn't the end all, but it's something we all like. So it, it's, it's, it's a vehicle to get there. And that's my dissertation in a nutshell. <laughs> very, very interesting. Because also, I think it's it's very cool for, you know, because when you talk about people, uh, when you talk to people about these things, about Eastern, you know, perspectives and things like that. And I have a personal belief that because of these whole processes that we've been through in history and how, you know, like, um, um, societies have just erased and just totally decided that no, some knowledge was just not knowledge. Um, I think we're slowly starting to find out that some of that was maybe all of it, maybe big chunks of that were actual knowledge. Like indigenous people would say um, that the forest is connected. Now we know that it is connected through fungi and a lot of other things. So it's cool because it gives people a perspective, like probably people who maybe have these beliefs of like, I only believe in science and maybe they're struggling with these things. And then you come in and you say, well, I have the best of both worlds for you. Right. <laughs> so in a, in, a, in a religious, in a like a Hasidic religious perspective, right? Science only leads you towards more unveiling what is already there in a, in a godly world or in a, in a universally connected world. So science is only uncovering what's already there. So in the beginning, science didn't recognize what science couldn't measure, what science couldn't understand. Yeah. As science becomes more sophisticated, as we'll be able to look at your brain with an MRI, Freud never was able to do that, right? So he's sure. developed theories, right? But theories need to be tested. They need to be revisited. They need to be challenged, right? So science really only tells us about the physical aspect of the world that's already here in creation, right? And so, yes, so the more we learn, the more we begin to validate all of these, you know, whether you call them indigenous practices or different practices that were, were here, right? And, and we're discounted, ignored. Yeah, yeah, so. Science is beautiful. So I have just, um, uh, the last two questions there, which I think uh, you can tell me if you, if you want to talk about it or we can stop here. 
but I think it'd be it's important because it's also the bulk of your work, which it has to do with uh, people with disabilities. I think um, in your in your website you say you've stated that having a disability doesn't make you a sexual. So like if you're saying that there is a reason, right? So like my question is why why do you think people like when they're faced with a disability or maybe an injury, they just arrive to this conclusion? Or maybe how well uh, what what do you think? Why do you think so? Or uh, what have you found that? So what I found through talking with a lot of people, first through research and spinal cord injury, and then through counseling and coaching of other people and through literature, is that people learn about sex from having sex. They learn about sex from porn. They learn about sex from every place, but where they should learn about sex. And then they have either an illness or in the case of a spinal cord injury, an injury that substantially changes their ability to sexually function and respond and even sometimes express. I always talk about sexual function, response, and expression. So people are focused on their function, right? So after an injury like spinal cord injury, where they may have either reduced sensation, because not everyone loses sensation, they might have reduced sensation, they may have totally no sensation, they may be able to get an erection but not maintain an erection, but the stimulation doesn't cause the arousal they were used to, there's likely no ejaculation for men. Women might feel dry, right? So their 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 first experience is usually with masturbation, with self exploration, and when they explore themselves, looking at a very genitally focused, performance focused medical model of sex, right? They touch themselves and they say it's not the same. It's not normal. When they engage and practice, they say it's pointless. Why bother? Once again, the goal-oriented mindset has been set before the injury or illness, right? So we have to get people away from that, which means teaching them an awful lot about human sexuality. I teach people about human sexual response cycles in the plural. So I teach them about what's happening physiologically, what's happening psychologically, what's happening relationally, what's happening spiritually, what's happening reflectively, responsively. I teach them an awful lot about human sexual response and expression, right? And I also teach them a lot about things that could impair desire, right? And, and so we, 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 I teach all of those things to give people a different knowledge base and a different, more hopeful view of the future that's not based on the on their genitals. They use their genitals as a barometer of the future of their whole sex life. And so we need to disconnect our sexuality from our ability to function with our genitals, right? So unfortunately, there are guys who step on a landmine and lose their genitals. That doesn't mean that they're still not men. It, there are guys that, 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 that neither get married. I know people that are in heterosexual relationships or, or stay in marriages and uh, have sexual lives and learn different ways to, to have sex, but without using their, their own penis, which they don't have anymore, you know, and that could happen after cancer, right? And, and, and you could have, you know, any different things, or you could just have, uh, you know, after after prostate cancer or the inability to get an erection or something like that, you know? So it, it doesn't have to be as drastic, not that cancer is not drastic, but it doesn't have to be a traumatic injury. It could be, you know, a change, you know, and even women, you know, if, if they're, you know, lose sensation or change sensation, you know, secondary, you know, treatments for, for cancer or anything else, you know, can feel like they're not a sexual person anymore. Once again, we're measuring, our sexuality based on the function of our genitals. And if you understand sexuality to be our energy, our presence, right? Uh, you know, our, 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 you know, our ability to experience pleasure and share pleasure, then we know our ability to fulfill our roles or promises to our partners, right? Then, you know, 
an injury or even loss of your genitals doesn't render you as asexual. And that's what Tantra is giving us. Yes. So let's close with this. <laughs> I tell people, you don't have to break your neck to be a great lover, but you could learn a lot from somebody who has. So when we are forced to learn about sex, right? So when I broke my neck, it was either I was going to accept that I'm not functioning the same and give up, or I'm going to try to figure out why does this happen and not that. You know, it sent me on a journey of exploration. I was curious about my own responses. I read the books I read that turned me off. I discounted. I didn't, they, they, they didn't speak to me, right? And then I found the book on Tantra. It spoke to me. So I kept learning and learning and learning to the point of getting a PhD in human sexuality. <laughs> you know, so I just took it to a, a different level. So you don't have to break your neck to be a great lover, but you can from someone who has or someone with a disability. Anyone with a disability has learned to overcome societal stigma and let go of restic restrictive notions of sexuality and restrictive notions of orgasm that are pushed on us by the media and people trying to sell us things. There is nothing to say about that. Like, yes, right. yes, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs>